board zoom calls so i'm now officially recording you should see in your right is. Hand corner a little thing that says record so welcome to pub theology where we encourage recording. having some beverages alcoholic or not and enjoying a talk over theology we vote on each theological lesson each month that's my little pitch at the beginning in case you didn't catch anyway so uh, tonight, what we're taking on is a really good question. It is the number one most debated thing on the ELCA clergy website, which, by the way, is not affiliated with the ELCA at all. Um, it is, like, the number one thing, if you want to watch a whole bunch of pastors and theologians get really mad, is just ask their opinion about this and watch them go at it. Um, so my goal tonight will be to try to address the question specifically because it asks a very specific citation of the Book of Concord, which is which contains the Confessions of the Lutheran Church. Okay. And so we're going to address that specifically, but then we're going to widen it to, I think, what the actual question is, which is, is online communion valid? Okay. And we're going to look at the arguments for, the retorts against, the arguments against, the retorts against the against arguments, and so on and so forth, okay? Sort of like we have. And then we'll end with um, me giving my sort of two-second thoughts on online community. How does that sound to everyone? Does that sound like a plan? Uh, by the way, once I go into screen sharing mode, I cannot see you, which means if you have a question, concern, or problem, you just need to interrupt me. I do not mind being interrupted. I, in fact, welcome the interruptions, as does everyone else who has to listen to my voice as I continue on. Cool? All right. Let's see if I can do the screen share. There we go. See, I'm getting fancier here as I get the technology figured out. I got like whatever that is, Stardust. All right, so is online communion valid? The official question, by the way, is if we agree that nothing has the nature of the sacrament apart from the use instituted by it by Christ, and then that's the citation as to where that comes from in the Book of Concord, aka the Lutheran Confessions, is online communion valid? So it is a specific question and then sort of a general question. So we're going to take on them both. So we're going to take both of them on. All right. I need to move you guys. All right. So this is a big question. So let's break it down. Uh, let's do a quick review of what exactly is being asked. Okay. We're, we're going to be taking on, like I said, the specific argument that's being made because we're making a specific citation that some people are using to argue that online communion is not in fact valid. Um, then we'll look at the arguments for and against the validity of online communion. Um, in case you're wondering what all those weird letters were, they were a citation to a particular book, which is within the Book of Concord called The Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord. Now the Book of Concord is actually like an anthology, so it's actually a whole bunch of writings put into one book, okay? And all these writings together make the Lutheran Confessions. So the Formula of Concord is, of course, a book inside the Book of Concord, because, you know, that keeps it from being super confusing, right? So the Book of Concord, like I said, is actually an anthology of the Confessions of the Lutheran Church. So those Roman numerals are meaningful, but only insofar as finding what the person was quoting. Which, by the way, did I tell you the story of how this came to me? Okay, this is crazy. Um, so, as you all know, people can, like, file these questions um, anyway, anywhere, anonymously, or whatever. So, I got this question from a Facebook uh, profile. But I didn't, like, recognize exactly who it was. But I'll take a question from anyone. It doesn't bother me. I mean, a good question is a good question, right? Um, and when, when I went to go look at it, Facebook had closed it down for being a fake account. Okay, which means like someone went through way too much work to file a question. Because I'll take, like I said, I'll take any question from anyone. Okay, so they closed down the, the profile 
And from what I could tell from what I could see of the profile, this was like the one thing the profile did. Uh, the other thing that's sort of funny about this is whoever cited it, cited it absolutely correctly, meaning whoever this person is, has a reasonably high level theological understanding of the Book of Concord, which tells me we're dealing with someone who's relatively educated. Um, so whoever it is is pretty smart, which I just, I find this really funny because again, are you questions. implicating, are you implicating Pastor Todd here? By no means. I am not implicating Pastor Todd. In fact, Pastor Todd would probably argue that all the arguments I just made unimplicated him. Well, and first of all, Todd would have to know how to create this fake account. And I guarantee yeah. you, he could not. <laughs> yeah, he's still like a, yeah, he's, his, his Facebook yeah. profile still doesn't have a picture. Right. It's all a facade. He's very cunning. <laughs> all a facade he does know more about technology than i think he lets on sometimes but i i don't see him doing that because if he wanted to file some sort of like really crazy question with me he would just like send it with with like happy emojis all around it or shout down the hall or shout down the hall yeah yeah well right now we're all social distance so you know he'd do the emoji equivalent of that Todd is a Todd is a lot of things, but he sneaky is not what I would ever describe him as. <laughs> Funny, loving, caring, but mm, sneaky, not really. I think it would be no fun to make fun of someone unless you were able to like claim, you know. All right, moving on before I get myself into too much trouble on a recorded line. So how uh, how to think about the Lutheran confessions? Uh, just because different Lutheran churches look at this differently. So when you have a question, the first place all Lutherans are urged to go is the Bible, okay? So this is not the equivalent of like Catholic doctrine, right? Because the ultimate authority in Lutheranism is going to be scripture, okay? If, however, the Bible is unclear or the Bible is silent on an issue, then you're urged to go to the creeds of the church, the Nicene, the Apostles, and the Athanasian, okay? For further clarification. So a great example of that is the creed spend a lot of time talking about the Trinity. You can read the Bible and it can be easily unclear as to how the Trinity works. You go to the creeds, the creeds take a lot of painful stakes clarifying how the Trinity works. Okay. Now, if the creeds seem silent or unclear on the issue, that's when you go to the Book of, uh, of, the Book of Concord or Lutheran Confessions, however you want to call it. If all three are unclear, then you go to the governing documents of our denominational body. I bring this up because we're going to be talking about these different documents as we work through this question. Um, and so it's just important to know what the hierarchy is. Okay. So if, the, so if you have an argument from the Bible, it always trumps an argument from the confessions. Okay. If you have an argument from the creeds, it always trumps an argument from a document of the church. But the confessions trump a document of the church. You guys follow the sort of hierarchy here? Now, granted, all this doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, individual consciousness trumps all of these things. So, so, but if you want to know what the church says, or if you want to get into a debate within the confines of the church, this is sort of the rule. Okay. Um, and as you move down layers, you have to give for, you have to give leniency for more diversity. So if all you have to stand on is a document of the church, then it becomes much harder to enforce it. It's more likely that they're simply going to suggest you do this if they can't find a scriptural basis or a confessional basis or a creedal basis for it. Any questions so far? I know we haven't really gotten into the questions. It's a lot of prep, but it's a deep question. So here is the actual quote of what was being, oh, Joe, were you going to say something? Oh, I, I, I was oh, going to ask David. whether we subscribe to the confessions because they explicate the word of God or insofar as they explicate the word of God. Oh, okay. So I would argue that, it, that within ELC Lutheranism, you'll find a diversity of answers on that. So I think it would depend on the theologian you're talking to, because some of them would go one way, some would go the other. And that is an important distinction. 
Um, it's whether or not they are a perfect explanation or whether or not they are an explanation or, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but let's, jumping to sort of the question that's going on here. Is that, is that okay, David? Or do you want to yeah, go more into that? that? That answers my little, my question itself, yeah. Okay. Um, so if you go into here and you say, uh, if you actually go to the quote, it says, let us now come to the second point. And so they're talking about the Lord's Supper in, in the, uh, at this point, of which I mentioned was a little before. So he's mentioning that, okay, we talked about the Lord's Supper before, we're going to keep talking about it. We're going to be talking about the right ways and the wrong ways to do it. And that's sort of in the subject, okay? So that's what it's noting. Uh, to preserve the true Christian doctrine concerning the Holy Supper and to avoid the, uh, and, or to avoid and abolish manifold idolatrous abuses and perversions of this testament, the following useful rule and standard has been derived from the word of the institution. Okay, and then it's Latin, okay, which translates to nothing has a nature of the sacrament apart from the use instituted by Christ. Okay, Latin again, apart from the action divinely instituted. That is, if the institution of Christ be not observed as he appointed it, there is no sacrament. This is by no means to be rejected, but can be or can and should be urged and maintained with the prophet in the church of God. Okay. The basic gist being that there's a lot of debate at this point about um, what the sacrament is, what makes the sacrament a sacrament, and what therefore you can do or not do with it. So the two big subjects that are taken on right before this and right after this are going to be the subject of Calvinism and the subject of whether or not you have to take one or two elements, okay? Um, those are sort of two big controversies at the time. So John Calvin is another reformer. Um, he is where, he's sort of where Presbyterianism and to a point and to a lesser extent reformed churches sort of derive theological heritage from. Um, and he's going to argue, or he was arguing at the time, or he was arguing at the time of this thing, not of the time of Luther. Luther's an old man by the time John Calvin really becomes a major player. Um, but John Calvin's going to be arguing that um, what makes the sacrament a sacrament is the faith of the person taking it. Okay. Luther and later Lutherans really go, no, 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 no. The sacrament is an act, a divine act of God. Therefore, the faith of the person taking it is honestly inconsequential, okay? Because your faith doesn't make it a sacrament. God's promise makes it a sacrament, okay? The other practice that it's pushing back against historically is that Catholics would go ahead and often just give one kind rather than both wine and bread um, to the people uh, rather, and withhold one of the two. Uh, which again, Lutheranism said, "Well, hold on. The Bible says body and body and uh, blood, uh, bread and wine. You really should give people both, or at least they should have access to both." Okay, so that's what's being taken on in here. Honestly, most of the arguments within ELC Lutheranism will go to eighty-six, which is the next chunk, next paragraph down, um, rather than eighty-five, and we'll get into the reason why. So in, it comes down to really the 85 versus 86. So 86 is going to go on and specifically give scenarios like what we just talked about in which that's not okay. You can't just say, well, I don't think you have faith. You're not getting sacrament, okay? Or I don't want to give people bread today, so you all are just getting wine. Or I don't want to give wine today. You all are just getting bread, okay? Um, it's going to go into these sorts of things. And then it actually details things which are proper or things which are improper and things which are proper, okay? Oh, yes, sir, Matt. Yes. Um, when I get out my Ritz crackers and water, is that <laughs> okay. appropriate or do I need to be more? We will get there. We will get there. That's actually where we're headed. That's exactly okay. where we're headed. Okay? okay. So this is one of the huge, what happens between how you interpret 85 and 86 is a huge difference between ELCA Lutheranism and then Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod. And it's going to seem like a really nitpicky thing, but I want to walk you through how that changes that question that you just asked and this question too, okay? So if 85 in ELCA Lutheranism is understood to say, we should go ahead and try to do 
things the way Christ does, okay? And then 86 says, for example, okay, don't go ahead and, and hold it from people you don't believe are unfaithful because it's not their faith anyways that's doing anything. Don't go ahead and only have it as one sacrament. When you do it, use the words of institution. When you do it, go ahead and have, you know, representative bread and representative uh, fruit of the vine, okay? And so it gives these sort of things. So in ELSA Lutheranism, what we're saying is that the, the that 85 is sort of a prefix. It's giving you context for what 86 is about. And 86 is giving you more or less the rules, okay? In Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod, they go, no, 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 no. 85 is saying you need to do it as close to Christ as possible. 86 is a few examples of how you can go away from doing what Christ says. Okay. Now that seems like they're mostly saying the same thing, but it's crucial because it's the difference between me saying, when you make macaroni and cheese, for it to be macaroni and cheese, you need to make sure that you don't put in these three ingredients. Because if you put in tofu, it ceases being macaroni and cheese. Okay? Versus me saying macaroni and cheese is based out of uh, cheese, pasta, milk, butter, whatever else, right? Flour. Um, if I say like, this is what makes macaroni and cheese, cheese, don't put these in or it ceases being macaroni and cheese. If you interpret the first part as the only way to do it, then if you put bacon in there, not macaroni and cheese, right? But if you interpret the second part as simply don't put in tofu or it ceases, don't put in um, salmon or it ceases being macaroni and cheese, don't put in goat cheese or it ceases being macaroni and cheese. Well, then if that's the only scenarios, then you have a lot of leeway, right? And that is one of the differences between ELSA Lutheranism and Missouri to a, less, to a lesser extent, or Wisconsin Lutheranism, and then Missouri to a slightly lesser extent, because they're a little bit looser on it. Um, so the argument basically boils down to, if you're talking online communion, is if Jesus didn't do online communion, therefore no one can do online communion, because it's not the way Jesus did it, okay? Because we don't find a Zoom link in, in um, Jesus in the Bible, okay? So if communion is in, uh, but within ELSA Lutheranism, generally we wouldn't consider this a particularly strong argument because, again, of how we understand 85 and 86's relationship. So we would come back and say, hold on, if communion, if that's true, if we're going to hold that it, it has to be just like Jesus, does that mean... It's invalid if the bread is leavened, because Jesus is probably was unleavened. If it's gluten-free, because Jesus is, was definitely not gluten-free. What about grape juice? This argument we had in 85, 86 about grape juice, right? Because Jesus surely used wine. What about grape juice? Are we not, is that not valid? What happens if the presider is not Jewish? Jesus was Jewish. Okay, does the presider need to be ethnically Jewish? Or what happens if it's not Passover? Can we only do communion over Passover? And we go sort of down the sort of ridiculous strain, but it points to sort of a problem with the interpretation of 85 being too strict. Because ultimately, the reality is everyone, Wisconsin, Missouri, Synod, Lutheran, whatever, has to pick an arbitrary line, right? You know? Because none of them are going to say, well, you can only do it at Passover. But if we have to do it just like Jesus, why not Passover? This, by the way, also plays into the argument over female clergy or not, because Missouri Synod of Wisconsin will point to this and say, you can't have female clergy, Jesus wasn't uh, male. Now, granted, ELCA would say Jesus was most not likely white either. Why are we picking gender, not race? Right, but isn't there explicit condemnation of females having authority in the assembly? You also have examples of female pastors in the Book of Acts. So I think you have to take that in account too and say, well, yes, you do have a few things to say, well, women shouldn't, you know, you know, have authority here, but you also have to put that into its historical context. Um, and since we do have folks in the book of Acts, which even Paul will say is his equals, 
uh, like he does at the end of Philippians. Um, you know, I think there's a really good case. Or the fact that um, Peter himself stops his evangelism campaign to go back and I think it's is it Lydia. Yeah. Uh, when Lydia passes away, because she is basically a pastor. He refers to her um, in Greek as a deacon, but he refers to himself as that too. And he refers to Paul as that too. So whatever right, you think Peter is, and Paul is, you have to consider she to be the same. But but if the point is that we're talking about macaroni and cheese, and I say, don't put goat cheese in it, don't put onions in it, and later on you say, well, yeah, these are kind of hard and fast things. You never said don't put onions in it. You like you can say, well, yeah, there's a explicit, you know, uh, Second Timothy three says don't put onions in the macaroni and cheese. Right, but we know that Paul would have been knowledgeable of most of those. So would have Peter, um, and there were early Christian uh, female pastors. So whatever, however, and there are ways to interpret it in which those aren't direct commendation or direct um, condemnation of female pastors. And therefore, um, if, if you have the ability to say, well, it could mean no female pastors or it might not mean no female pastors when you read those things um, in a number of places, you can then look and say, well, the early church, did they have them? And they surely did. And in not even just the early church, not just sort of the patristic era, but you find it in the apostolic era too, where the apostles themselves even know uh, that there are female clergy and are per and clearly uh, perfectly fine. So then that leads you to say, well, if you interpret uh, the Bible's sort of co perceived condemnation of female leadership, then you are interpreting it differently than Peter did. You're interpreting it differently than Paul did. You're interpreting it differently than the early church did. And you've got to look at those interpretations as somewhat authoritative because you would think that people like Peter and Paul and the later early patristic uh, mothers and fathers would have had access to a better close understanding of the original meaning of a text than we do. So Pastor Matt, Yes. And uh, when uh, communion is uh, served via lay people, it's already been s sanctified with the words of institution by an ordained minister. Yeah. So when when we do the words of institution, um, that that's yeah, that's already been you've already had your sort of moment there at the words of institution, and then we hand it out. Uh, that's what me. Is that a part of the argument where it's not an ordained minister saying the words of institution in your home? Okay, so this is not actually asking that we can get onto that discussion, okay? Oh, okay. Um, but this is, when we're talking about online community, we're talking about as someone who's actually blessing it, like online. So like what we did okay. at Easter um, is what we're talking about. So I get online, I say, you bring all your stuff forward. I do words of institution as a ordained pastor and then you guys partake, okay? Is that okay. valid, okay? And then um, the other um, point I was gonna ask about, like, like in the early church, for example, they wouldn't allow lepers to come into the church, mm -hmm. but would they take communion out to them? You know, I'd have to like, look that up. My assumption is yes, but I would need to find a citation to be able to cite some that. Kind of similar, it's like you're, you're reaching out to the potentially ill and mm -hmm. allowing them to partake. You know, I'd have to go back and look um, on that. The point well, those are great questions. Those are great questions. I'm just not quite, I wasn't quite prepared for them, to be honest. Those are great questions, though, um, that we should definitely explore. Um, let me look that up. Give me some time to get back to you on that. Is that okay? Because it's a really good question. All right. All right, so I think... That particular argument has sort of within at least ELCA Lutheranism a pretty um, a pretty easy weakness. With that said, that is not an argument I'm hearing most of the people who are advocating against online communion, at least within the ELCA world, generally refer to. Uh, mostly because they would run right into that, well, hold on, what, are, what else would we have to turn back 
if we went along this line and how far do you go? Okay. And so that argument in general, again, I, I keep saying within ELCA Lutheranism probably wouldn't have much traction. Within Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod, it most definitely would because of their different understanding of the role of confession and their different understanding of the relationship between 85 and 86. Okay. Um, and so right now within ELC Lutheranism, theologians are split, bishops are split, pastors are split. I have good friends on every side of this argument. I have good friends who are bishops on every side of this argument who I respect. I have theologians on every side of this argument who I respect as far as I ever respect any theologians. Um, I, I was going to ask, is yeah. among um, like pastors and and whatever, would they would they think that it's like a sin if you try to do communion outside gets, the church? It's not. It's not doing it outside the church. Okay, that's not generally where people get hung up because I bring okay. like in a non-COVID world, I would be I would I brought uh, communion to people right. at home all the time, okay? And sometimes I didn't have time to grab consecrate communion, so I'd simply consecrate it there, okay? And, okay. No, and everyone's been doing that for generations. No one really bats an eye on that practice, okay? Okay. But, um, I mean, I guess more than um, a sin, it's like, do they honestly think we would be punished, you know, in some way for, so, for so, doing this? I mean, so, so the, I don't the, get why it's so great. I, you're preaching a little bit to the choir on this. Um, I, I can go into the arguments as they make them. Um, basically, the argument isn't so much as a sin, is that it's going to either mislead people um, to believing that they're taking the sacrament when they really aren't, okay? Or it's going to produce um, the, the more, that, that's the theological arguments, the more practical argument that I hear from, from that side is to say, you're going to get people into a bad habit. Um, and, you know, we don't really, we're not comfortable going down this road because what does this mean for everything? And I'll tell you, we can go down that because I think there's some serious questions about ecclesiology, which is like church structure that um, online communion brings up that people are not talking about that we need to. Uh, for example, each bishop in the ELCA has a geographical region so that they know that you can do X or Y within a physical boundary, okay? And, and when it comes to, and because we've always been set up that way, and honestly, almost all churches are, right? Whether you call them synods or dioceses or whatever, there's some sort of physical geographical boundary, and the bishop oversees all of what happens in the boundary. Okay. Because that's how almost all churches are established, you have a real challenge when you start going online because in most churches, one way diversity is um, fostered is to say, you know what, you folks in Nebraska can do what you want in Nebraska if you're a Nebraskan bishop says it's okay. And we folks out here in Sheboygan will do our thing if we feel like it's okay. And those folks in Vermont can do another thing if it's okay for folks in Vermont, okay? And that's been a way to do it. That, and, and so if you actually look across the ELCA, there's widely varying rules, especially when you get into things like communion or all sorts of different things, usually that have regional components to it or synod to synod components. And the reality is you could do the same with the Presbyterians, the Reformed Church, the Episcopalians, on and on and on, even the Catholic Church in some cases, okay? If you start to move everything online, what do you do if, uh, with the fact that what constitutes or what the like, um, what constitutes communion itself differs from synod to synod? And what do you do if um, someone participates in something that is a okay in um, Sheboygan because they're part of Greater Milwaukee that's not a okay in Tennessee? You know, who's who do you answer to? Does the pastor in Sheboygan answer to the pastor in Sheboygan or the bishop in Milwaukee? Or if the congregate's sitting in Chattanooga, does, does the pastor have to follow the rules of Tennessee? Um, because then the pastor could never really be online because you can't control who watches you on Facebook and what they do with what they see. 
because I can't say I'm not going to let anyone watch from Tennessee. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think that is one of the big ecclesial questions. It even comes down to questions of membership and stuff like that. But if you're, if you're choosing to go online to First United Lutheran Church, you're making a choice to do communion that way. Mm-hmm. No, so, I think... I'll, okay, I'll give you an example from my own life of how this got really complicated. So when I was in my internship year or vicarage year, all right, I was in, um, I was in um, the central southern Illinois, okay? And bi- first bishop is there. I come in. He gives me an authorization to do communion, even though I was not ordained, okay? Very special circumstance, okay? And so I'm doing communion. That bishop retires. New bishop comes in. New bishop's like, what is this? I'm not okay with non-pastors doing communion. Um, And so then he tries to figure out what to do. He eventually goes, you know what? I don't have a better solution. I'll let you keep doing this. Um, But I want, before you do anything, any communion outside of your church, you need to tell me because I need to okay it. I'm like, all right, you tell me what to do. I will follow the rules. Okay, I'm a good rule follower. Um, and so we got into this sort of this weird place because I, I think he's trying to figure it out as he goes along, uh, where we're trying desperately to figure out. So I can do communion at my church at Prince of Peace in Mount Vernon, Illinois. Okay, he signed off on that. Well, if one of my congregants goes to the hospital in Marion, Illinois, can I go bring communion there? He goes, Well, that makes sense. That person's your congregant. I go, Okay. What happens because my supervisor is overseeing me from a church in Marion, Illinois? What happens if one of his congregants goes to uh, get sick and he's on vacation? Can I bring it to his congregant? The bishop's like, well, they're not your congregation and it's not located in your city. I'm not comfortable with that. So then I said, well, what happens if one of his congregants comes to Mount Vernon on a Sunday? He says, well, they're in your city. They're at your church. You can commune whoever you want. Okay. My wife is in your synod. She gets sick. Can I go to Decatur, Illinois and go up there? He's like, no, because you're not called to be, you're not doing Decatur. I said, okay, well, one of my congregants is now sick. I mean, each one of these were individual actual issues. One of my congregants is sick, but he's so sick. They moved him to um, St. Louis, which is of course in Missouri, which is across, which is now in the synod of, of Missouri, Kansas. Can I do it there? And he was like, uh no because i can't authorize you in someone else's sin okay and i get sort of how we got to all these and i respect the decisions um and but if all of a sudden we have a chunk of our congregation in nebraska and and, and or a chunk of our congregation Chatt- chattanooga this becomes endlessly complicated and it's not just communion. There's a lot of diversity in what's allowed and not allowed. Um, because there's a lot of places where bishops feel really strongly one way and they feel really strongly the other. And they say, well, you know, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and let's not fight about it. Um, and that becomes a lot more difficult if all of a sudden I can bolt, if I as a congregant can be like, well, if I don't like what my bishop's doing in Tennessee, I'll just watch, I'll just attend church in Sheboygan. Or if I don't like what my bishop's doing in Sheboygan, I'll just attend church in New York, you know? Um, but I think that's the future and we'll need to figure out. How to do that. So that's a long answer to a short question, but you know, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, but back to, back to the subject. So, so why are there good arguments on both sides? Um, there really are good arguments on both sides. And so we're gonna walk through the three arguments Again, the three best arguments I think that are out there against and three best arguments that are out there before. And then we'll finish up with my thoughts. on Okay, if my computer would like to respond. There we go. So the first major argument is the argument against by the question of distribution. Oh, I didn't realize I could do that. Okay. All right. In all the, in this is an argument against basically focusing in on the distribution aspect of communion. So um, basically folks would argue this would say in all the accounts of the Last Supper in the Bible, okay, and there's multiple, right? Jesus distributes a meal. This idea of distribution is backed up in the confession, confessional documents in multiple locations, in addition to the use of the means of grace, which is a, which is the guiding governing document over how to do sacraments for pastors. 
um, that there's a need for the distribution, the physical handing of communion. If you define distribution as the physical handing of something from one person to another, then how can this be done online? Does that not break the actual concept of distribution, which is part of the actual command, because he says, go ahead and do this, right? He said, go give this to people. Um, and you can point to history too. They would point to the particularly writings of the patristic era about, uh, about controversies over private communion. So there was a really early question over whether or not a pastor could like sit down and give himself or herself communion in the early church, okay? Can I just sit down, I'm an ordained minister, you know, grab my thing, go do, 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 and have communion by myself. And the answer was no. Now, the problem is there's a lot of controversy over why the answer was no. One of the arguments for why the answer is no from the Patristic era is that it, that private communion has no distribution because you can't distribute to yourself. That's just eating, not distributing. Okay. The counter argument to this, isn't distribution of the sacrament in the confessions pointing to the core need to get the sacrament to all those who seek it? Okay. If it was, if I was to quote, distribute food in a disaster, does it not count if I airdrop you food, right? Like if you need food in a disaster and I fly over you as the, as you know, the national guard and I can't figure out how to get my plane on the ground, but I put a parachute and I parachute you a box of food, I still distributed the food, right? That's sort of the, that's the argument against it. Is, is it not distribution because you are fed? So it comes down to how you define distribution. There's an argument from assembly. It's going to be a very similar argument. They're going to say in all the accounts in the Bible of the Last uh, Supper, people are physically assembled. You are physically there. It is worth noting, this is backed up again in the confessional documents where it says you gather the assembly and then you do these things. And in fact, they can cite 85 because 85 does note, um, just or I say 84 technically, does note that, you, that Jesus assembled people as a group. Okay, so people will cite 84 and then use 85 saying 84 is a preamble. And so this is one of those specifically um, defined things you, you have to do, you have to assemble. And Jesus physically assembled folks. Um, and so you define, a, if you define assembly in the confessional documents and the use of the means of grace in the Bible as a physical gathering, which I think there is a good argument that in all those cases, they are in fact physical gatherings, then how in the world can you do it online? Because no one's actually physically gathered. You're behind your phone, I'm behind my computer, someone else is watching three hours later on Facebook. There isn't an actual assembly, okay? And again, they, they would point to the same argument that occurs over private communion, and they would say the reason the patristic mothers and fathers banned a private communion was because there is no assembly. You can't do it alone. The counter argument to this is how is online not an assembly? What is the core of what makes something an assembly? Is the most hostile, hate-filled, conflict-ridden church an, assemb uh, an assembly and the most loving, supportive online community not? Who gets to decide this? If online isn't a real assembly, then how are we having synod assemblies online? How are we electing bishops online? How are we having annual meetings online? How can it be valid sacramentality, but not valid sort of church polity? Because no one's arguing about those. But isn't uh, like voting in people and so on, that's not a sacrament. It isn't. And that would be the argument, the sort of counter counter argument is to say, oh. There are different rules for sacramentality than there is for polity. Okay. And polity is ultimately derived into, it derived into some sense of legalism, where sacramentality okay. is derived in some form of mystery um, and biblical command. So that would be the counter-counter. So you actually, you got it absolutely right. That that would be the retort to the retort. Okay. Um, 
Then here's, here's an argument that I found really interesting. This actually comes from the global south, um, which I always find the relationship between our theologians and the global south interesting insofar as they like to talk a lot about how they support the global south. And then when the global south says, hey, guys, you're doing something wrong, um, our theologians are like, do, 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 and ignore it. So the global south has come back and said, there's an argument of justice here. For decades, the global south, or the two-thirds world, or however you want to call it, uh, Lutherans have had a major, major clergy shortage. Okay? This has been going on for 30, 40 years now. Okay? So much so that it leads to an impracticality of regular communion. It's just they can't, they can't do it. You have one guy covering 20 churches, you can't have communion every week. It's just physically impossible. The ELCA has been asked repeatedly for 40 years, or its predecessor bodies, because it hasn't been around that long, um, to help with this massive clergy shortage, and basically, we haven't done anything, or what we've done is marginal at best, okay? Um, and basically said, you know what, it's not that big of a deal, you guys figure it out. Um, to our sister and brother uh, denominations in the Lutheran World Federation, uh, basically saying, it isn't that big of a deal. So they've come back and said, now hold on. So when we couldn't do it because of clergy shortage, it wasn't a big deal. But now that you can't get weekly communion, you need to go to something that's questionable go by going online, or at least controversial. How is that just? Why was it okay for us to take a Sabbath or um, take time where we couldn't have it, but the second you guys in the first world can't, it's all of a sudden an issue. Isn't there something fundamentally unjust about this? Okay. Secretary General, by the way, of Lutheran World Federation made this argument. Counter argument, okay? Um, and I'm finding very few theologians willing to make the counter argument here, but I think it's a legitimate counter argument to say, okay, Perhaps we've been hypocritical for 40 years. You're probably right. There's probably a justice issue. However, does two wrongs make a right? Like just because we may have neglected our duties for 40 years, does that mean we should have to suffer uh, when we don't necessarily have to suffer because needless suffering without communion is ridiculous, even if we maybe did that to you? Because, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. You guys follow the counter argument there? Yeah, I guess I, I don't understand if, are, are, are there, aren't there deacons or like, can you go to a Presbyterian kind of, or like a, uh, a board of elders style? Like, why not just change the church government so that deacons can administer communion? Are you, talking, like about, what you, are you talking about the ELCA or in these sister church groups? Well, in the in the sister church, like if, if that's such a problem that you can't distribute the Lord's Supper regularly, then like create a system in which you can. I I, I, well, I, I don't understand why. Okay. No, great question, David. No, really good question. Okay, so so this leads into a whole different controversy. So, and this is part of what they're saying is a justice issue. So that's exactly what a lot of our sister churches first uh, first did. Okay. Um, when they can, and they do do it, is to say, I'll bless a whole bunch today uh, as I'm sort of running my circuit, think very Methodist style. I'll run my circuit, I'll bless it, but I'll bless six weeks worth of it. I'll be back in six weeks when you guys run out, okay? Now, in some areas, uh, that works fine. In other areas, it's still, you can't pull it off, okay? Because you end up with vinegar by the time the, the guy gets back six months later, okay? Um, so there was a question of why don't we just like write a letter as the bishop and sort of ordain the place, okay, to sort of use an Episcopalian language, all right? Um, and the ELCA for a long time really opposed that idea. And even today, like I was essentially, again, we'd never use the word ordain to place, but I had a letter to place um, there. And I actually had another case where I did that in Nebraska um, before I got officially ordained. With that said, I mean, I know there are bishops currently out there and theologians currently out there who would say that was a horrible thing that was allowed. That should never be allowed. That is bad order and it violates the concept of good order in the confessions. Now, obviously, I don't think that or I wouldn't have done it. 
Um, but they're pointing to the fact that we have pushed on them for years. And again, it wasn't until we had started to have a clergy shortage that we're like, yeah, you know, maybe bishops should be able to write letters. Um, and so it's sort of coming from the same vein of saying, you know what, when we had this problem first, we, you had all these theological issues. Now that you have the problem, your theological issues seem to be vanishing quickly. Um, and so they're sort of saying, oh, look, now you're having it worse than we are, and you have all these new theological ideas, like online communion. Yeah, that's um, And while I really do get the sentiment, okay, um, I, I hear the counter argument in the, yeah, all of what you're saying is probably very true. Do two wrongs make a right? Maybe we should re-examine how we treat our sister denominations which I think is a legitimate thing. And I think we need to examine how um, rigid we can be sometimes in our hierarchies, which is I think also a legitimate discussion to have um, and how we approach that. That sort of answer the question, David? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. To dumb it down into my terms. Okay. It's like how I wasn't allowed to work from home ever. And then yes. suddenly, totally cool. Keep productivity up. It's okay to work from home now. Right? I have no clue how to reposition this up and down. <laughs> Sorry, what were you going to say, Gail? If, oh, Karen. Uh, yes. I was going to just ask, what if uh, at least the wafers are mailed to each uh, person? Uh, that, is also, that is also another possibility. Uh, mailing communion is another possibility. You do run into state law issues, so nothing to do with the church, okay. uh, because you can't mail alcohol without all sorts of insane terms. Well, I, 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 that's why I said the wafers only. Yeah. You know, now, granted, it would depend. Um, my my theologians down there, and I say that's because it's a school I went to, but if you know me, you know I make fun of them all the time, um, out, out at LSDC, would be like, you can't do that. You're only giving one kind. That's directly a violation of my in 86. Um, now, our, I would argue in retort, I'm not forcing you to only take one kind, right? Like the Catholic scenario was you want two kinds, I give you one. But if you want both kinds and I can only cough up one, am I not still in the spirit? I guess I was just thinking if there was a way you know, then there's intervention by an ordained minister, like the wafers have been blessed absolutely that's actually what they do at my at mom's church in new york um i still follow their stuff um st john amherst in new york pastor scott still he you get a small bottle of wine and a package of wafers gluten-free or regular and you can make an appointment and <coughs> there and, and you can drive up and they'll hand you your box for the next couple of weeks. Here's your box to take home for the service. Um, and absolutely. You can't bring everybody into the church. And so what they've done is they've done a, you can schedule an appointment to pick up your package for that Sunday's communion. Okay. Yeah, no, and again. I guess well, my reason for asking is, does that satisfy anybody's argument? You know. In, Oh, yeah, no, I, and I would say that um, it would depend, okay? So the question would become, is, like, if your issue is distribution, so let's say the reason you're against online is because you don't think it's proper distribution, then that might satisfy the argument insofar as I have, you know, I passed or blessed it, and then I distributed it through the mail system. Now, some people could argue that's not distribution because I'm not a person handing it to a person. A person putting it in a box, sending it to a person who then delivers it to another person. Okay. So there would still be some in the distribution camp that would say, no, 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 you're not doing the personal handle. It doesn't satisfy those who object under assembly because they'd still say, well, you're not assembled. Okay. Um, and none of these are going to satisfy the justice argument because they're sort of objecting to the entire argument itself being had. Um, so I, I think there are, it would satisfy some. Um, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to move on to the arguments 
four now. So I gave, I think, the three best arguments I've seen out there. And there are tons. There are tons and tons of arguments against it, okay? There's like, there's tons and tons of arguments for it. I'm just trying to pick the ones that I found most intriguing. And the ones I ran into when I watched Theologians debate. Which, yes, I did actually sit down and watch a two-hour debate among theologians on this issue. That's how much I like you guys, okay? All right, so... Um, Argument for online communion from the argument of meaningfulness, okay? Since the Holy Spirit moved, since the Holy Spirit is, uh, the Holy Spirit moved within and around the people of God, okay? So the Holy Spirit moves in and around the people of God, and if the people of God are yearning for something, should we not listen to the yearning, okay? There's a long tradition within the ELCA to say part of the way the Spirit interacts is through the people. That's why we elect our bishops. That's why we elect our leadership because the Holy Spirit leads the people to further revelation, further knowledge of what the Holy Spirit is actively doing in the world, okay? It's sort of our concept of how revelation occurs. Um, and that's why over time we will allow something and see, does it bear fruit or does it not bear fruit? If it doesn't how, bear fruit, get rid of it. How, how can you tell it apart from enthusiasm? It's hard. The argument would generally go that, let's say you have something that the community of God is split on. If the community of God is split, you should allow the freedom, whichever argument is arguing for the freedom to do something, to go, and then you wait to see if it bears fruit. If it doesn't bear fruit, it will die off like the Gnostics. It will die off like the Manichaeans. Um, if it does, if it does bear fruit, then it must be of God for only things of God bear fruit. Which is also part of why our polity says one bishop, you go do your thing, other bishop, you go do your thing. But our polity also says that if my bishop wants to go do something and I feel like, no, I'm not okay with that, I don't have to. So the, so you always have this individual consciousness or bound consciousness is the language you use where I can say to my bishop, I don't want to do what you're doing because I don't feel that's okay. And then I don't need to. But if my bishop doesn't feel something's okay, I can't go and do it. I can't do something more free than my bishop, but I can always do something less free in the sense of freedom to do. Okay. Not freedom from. Um, therefore, if people experience online community as valid and fruits of the spirit are created, does that not confirm the validity of the sacrament itself? Or more precisely, they'd say, we don't know. Shouldn't we allow it? Sit back and see what happens. Because if it doesn't bear fruit, it will die out. If it does bear fruit, well, it, it was meant to be. Um, who are we to put limits on God's grace or God's ability to be really present, especially in times of emergency? counter argument to this well the argument sounds good it can't it can it 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 can ultimately justify just about anything right by going down the road um you affirm if you affirm this argument you will destroy in time any sense of good order ultimately undermining any sense of community cohesion because you can always say well hold it i want the freedom to do this thing why don't we just let it play out um, and in theory, you could argue anything that way. And if we allow it to be argued about the sacrament, then what the heck aren't we going to allow it to be argued about? And does that not endanger us to sort of go down any number of dead ends? How do we know we don't become the Gnostics and die out? Okay. That becomes sort of the, that's the counter argument. Argument from dignity. So the use of the means of grace and confessional documents outline that the sacrament should never be used to undermine the dignity of the individual who is receiving the sacrament, while at the same time stating that the sacrament should be readily available in ways to uphold dignity. So throughout the confessions, you will see, particularly when pushing it back against Catholic practices of banning people um, or excommunicating people from the sacrament, you'll find this throughout the confessions, you'll find this throughout ELCA documents usually pushing back against those sorts of issues, okay? Saying we shouldn't go, well, you don't believe as I do, you can't come here, okay? 
especially if you're talking about political things or very picky theological things or things that are up for debate, right? So you have this sort of rule. So they say, since faithful Christians can point to biblical arguments why in-person communion would be unethical, okay? In other words, well, COVID is ravaging the landscape. I don't, I, you know, I as an individual Christian could make the argument, I uh, feel that you asking me to assemble in a physical sense is asking me to do an immoral action, okay? Since there are some that would make the argument. Not saying the argument is good or right, just that some would in faith make the argument. Are we not violating their bound consciousness and therefore their individual dignity by giving them the impossible choice by saying you either get the sacrament or you violate your personal morals? Because we're not going to offer you a way that you as a reasonable person find moral um, to get the sacrament. How is this fundamentally different than denominations that withhold co communion over political or ethical issues? I, I bring that out, or the, the folks bring that out, because the ELCA has condemned other denominations who, over ethical issues, have said, well, we're not going to give communion to any number of folks. So if we're going to condemn that, then aren't we making a moral judgment by not giving communion to folks who maybe think that they are violating biblical principles by assembly. Now, granted, this is a limited argument, right? There's a natural limit to this argument because this argument only works if reasonable, faithful people can make the argument that they are somehow doing an immoral act by assembly, which I think in time of COVID-19, it's reasonable. But in a post-COVID world, it becomes a bigger and bigger stretch. You guys follow? So there's a natural limitation to this argument where it's really arguing for an exception to the rule for the period of time and for equivalent periods of time. Counter argument to this is to say, this is not a violation of dignity since I'm not banning you from the freedom to do something, right? Because what you are asking to do does not exist, okay? So if online communion isn't valid, and I tell you, I can't give you communion online, I'm not actually stopping you from doing something. Because you're asking for something I can't give you. And me saying, but I can't give it to you, isn't banning. You follow the difference? Yes, no? I'm very good at being at muddying waters. Therefore, I'm no more infringing on your freedom by saying that communion online is not valid than I would be infringing on your freedom by saying you can't go ride unicorns. I tried to be funny, lighten it up a little. Figured we'd, okay. Yay, I got at least one pity laugh. Okay. Arguments from accessibility. Throughout the Lutheran confessions, there is a push to always give rather than withhold the sacrament. Okay, throughout it, there's always talks about expanding who the sacrament can be given to. When the question's been brought forward about the sacrament itself historically, okay, so we're getting beyond Lutheran confessions, we have historically always opted to further, ex uh, further accessibility rather than a place for uh, further limitations on the sacraments and its accessibility. For example, there were debates over gluten-free, right? Is that valid? Ultimately, you said, of course it is, it's fine. Leavened bread, we had those arguments too. Some people said, well, you can't do it, it's not really a sacrament. We eventually went, ah, God's grace abounds. Grape juice, the confession or peace before communion. There were Lutheran churches um, as far as the 1930s that ended up becoming part of the ELCA, that if you did not say the peace to everyone in church, no communion for you because your heart was not at peace. Or if you did not go in and do your confession so that your heart was cleansed of the sins, you couldn't have communion that week. Some of you may remember having to go in and confess like on Saturday night before Sunday morning or the priest or pastor wouldn't give you communion. Okay? That's where all this comes up from. Each time, historically, throughout Lutheranism, and this spans all the way back, the option that Lutherans have always taken is to go, you know what, let's expand accessibility. God will figure it out. How is this different? Why don't we trust God to do this? If we trust him with gluten-free, unleavened grape juice, 
um, people who have not confessed and are maybe not at peace with the person in the pew in front of them who they are throwing spit wads at. Counter argument. This is fundamentally different because we're speaking of things which are fundamental to the sacrament itself, not elements of the sacrament, okay? Basically, there's something fundamental about how the sacrament is occurring versus like what makes up the sacrament. Almost all our arguments up to this point have been what makes up the sacrament or what the pastor needs to have. There has been a series of arguments over the validity of a pastor's sacrament. Um, and those have always gone for accessibility too. But that's different than the actual blessing itself, which is what's being taken on here. So those are the arguments for and against. Um, and then I'll give you my sort of thoughts on it. But before I get too far into my thoughts, why don't we, what are your all's thoughts on it? Or what are your thoughts on the arguments you've heard so far tonight? I guess I still want to know if it's okay if I use Ritz crackers and water. <laughs> doesn't bother me. Let me put it that way. It doesn't bother me. Um, but it would bother, there would be a lot of folks who would be bothered by it. Yeah, okay. Um, it doesn't bother me um, because it's what you have. And I would argue that God's grace abounds. Um, should we use it as communal worship? Um, probably not. Why? Because it would probably needlessly scandalize some other folks. And anything which can be a block to someone's faith, we should avoid uh, when possible. Um, so, but if it isn't causing your faith to stumble to have Ritz crackers, uh, I don't receive a problem. Okay. Uh, just for those who maybe don't know, what? Those, those elements are symbolic present mm -hmm. the body and blood of mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, no. They, they are the body and blood of Christ. They, yeah, they are They're, the body and representation. blood. They're mm -hmm. Right, right. Christ is really present in both. Yes. I guess I enough to go there. <laughs> well, we say really present. The, the body and blood of Christ is really present. We were yeah. not going to transubstantiation, which is that they on a, on a transcendental level change. But I mean, you, you can make all kinds of arguments about what kind of bread was on the table at the, at the Last Supper and what? what kind of wine. Was it really wine? Was it vinegar? Right. Um, you know, it was, it was the beverage that was on the table, likely fermented. Um, uh -huh. you, you know. Um, in that time period, it might have had lead in it, too. That was often put into bad wine to make it sweeter. Yeah. So, so I mean, having been at, I, you know, I remember Luther League with communion, and it was orange crush and glazed potato chips, because that's what we had. The pastor was there. That was communion for a bunch of teenagers. Um, nobody was going to bring wine into a bunch of teenagers. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would like it. So, so like, I'm trying. I don't want to go down this very thorny road too far. Okay. Um, again, I think we can see in like the Council of Jerusalem that there needs to always be a caution against those things that could be stumbling blocks for others, uh, which is why, yes, you can eat the idol meat, but mm -hmm. you don't eat it if it is going to cause someone's faith to be damaged. Um, and so when it comes to these things, I guess for me at least, I would say I could easily see how doing something like that could damage people's faith. And therefore, I don't even go to, is it really communion, is it not? That level of argument. Because to me, if it's gonna damage people's faith, it isn't even worth having the second side of the argument to figure out if it is or isn't. Um, unless there's a reason we can only do that. And then that's a whole different ballgame. Which I think we're in a situation where, you know, we're in a whole different ball game under COVID than normal. Yeah, David. Um, my, I, I kind of wanted to bring up First Corinthians 11 as it applies to the assembly situation. Okay, why don't you read it? Uh, sure. 
so uh, there, there's apparently some sort of issue involving the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to mm -hmm. some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Mm -hmm. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. Mm -hmm. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you people have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. For Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, mm -hmm. this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the mm -hmm. very body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Mm -hmm. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. All right. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. Mm -hmm. All right. If anyone so, is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, mm -hmm. it may not result in judgment. And when I come, Absolutely. I will give further direct. Absolutely. Okay. So this is actually a really important verse in our understanding of sacramentality, which actually leads to another point. And I'm blanking on exactly where it is in the confessions, but it says, if you um, eat and drink of the uh, blood and body of Christ, um, I'm trying to get the exact wording right. Oh, um, if you eat and drink of the blood of Christ uh, with the purpose of scandal in the heart, I think that's about right, but it might not be the right, quite the best interpretation. You eat and drink to your own damnation. Okay. Now, again, this is going to be very differently interpreted between the ELCA and the Missouri Synod. And it's going to be because of our understanding of what is occurring in that Corinthians passage. So what is happening, give you background to Corinthians. What's happening in the Church of Corinth is that you have a dispute between the two classes of people. You have sort of a gentry class and you have a working class, all right? It, and this is true just in the Roman Empire in general, okay? You have a small group of folks, they're landowners, they're exceedingly wealthy, they have a lot of time on their hands. You have the day laborers, workers in the field who are working really hard, physical labor, and they work all day long, okay? So what's happened in Corinthians is this. They have communion in the evening, but the day laborer doesn't get off until after sunset, because they work until sunset, then they're done, okay? So the rich class is getting together, let's say, and we don't know the timing, so I'm just gonna make up hours here, but let's say they're getting together at like four o'clock, and in that time period, what you would do is you'd have a huge meal, like a literal meal, okay? Um, so you'd have like um, basically a giant buffet and you'd eat and then the church service would happen while you have your giant potluck, okay? But here's the thing. The really rich people could afford really good food. The day laborers could not afford really good food. So the potluck food that the rich folks are bringing was really good and the food that the day laborers are bringing wasn't as good and so the rich folks started getting together and being like hey i don't like the food that those folks bring because they're poor but you know what they all work until sundown let's get together at like 3 p.m we'll start the meal then we'll all have an early dinner have communion, then we can clean up all our stuff and get the heck out of there before they come. And uh, yeah, we're good to go. We don't actually have to associate with those folks. Okay. So what Paul's addressing is horrific class division. Okay. 
is a addressing the fact that they are not treating their brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, as truly part of the community. And so when he speaks of, if you're sneaking in there and in your heart, what you are trying to do is avoid people who you think are lesser than you, then you have missed the entire point of being a Christian. And so whatever you think you're doing, because you are not a Christian assembly, ain't the sacrament. Because the sacrament needs the Christian assembly. Okay? Um, and so I would honestly argue that the stress is that the assembly needs to be Christian. And while that would definitely be an argument that those who make the argument against it from the standpoint of assembly would legitimately point to, okay? I think the counter argument would still stand to say, hold it, can't a Christian assembly of loving, caring people be online? In fact, they could flip it and say, see, in person doesn't matter. How you treat your brother and sister is what makes you, you know, are you a Christian assembly is what's important. The Christian, the assembly is secondary. You follow? And therefore there might be, under that sort of logic, there might be Christian assemblies of folks or people who go to church and they're not getting valid communion because they're all there for the wrong reason. It's worth noting this gets carried out in the confessions and even in ELCA Lutheran documents in a very interesting way. I technically, any given Sunday, could refuse communion to any given person. Okay? So I could be like, Joe, no communion for you. However, if I did that, and I'm just picking on Joe because I'd never do that to him because he's a great guy. Um, if I did that, Joe could go to my bishop and be like, he refused me communion and violated my dignity. And then I would have to prove, the level of proof I'd have to prove is that I knew without, uh, I knew without any reasonable doubt, okay? So sort of beyond reasonable doubt that Joe's only sole reason to take communion was to scandalize or hurt his fellow Christians. Okay. Again, the stress in that is not that the assembly is assembled, but that the assembly is that Joe, it's not that Joe's faith made it happen or not happen, but I wanted to withhold the sacrament because the only purpose he had was the harm of somebody else. It's worth noting this got into the confessions out of a fear that witches were going to come up for the assembly, take the wafer, and then use it for witchcraft later, um, is the sort of history behind that. Um, so again, that stresses the Christian part rather than the assembly part. Now you have to be really careful because the confessions are also equally con condemning of sort of Calvinist theology that says it's based on the faith of the person. So it becomes really key that I must use it for the intent of harm. Um, because it isn't my faith, it's my intent to harm, that's why I withhold it. Be not because it isn't the sacrament, but I withhold it because you're intending to harm. You follow? Does that sort of answer your question, David? It does, yeah. Okay. It, it just seems like the instruction that Paul gives, which is just stop having separate meetings all over the place, is kind of what we're forced to have by nature of the disease. Right, but I think, it, and again, this would get into the argument, is is it that, which I think is a valid argument, David, okay? I want to make it's sure like you hear me affirm right? Right, but or is it the intention of why you're why you're being separated? Um, and so what drives it? And I think those that's where I mean, I think both are valid interpretations, which is why good faithful Christians are split on this issue. Because all these things are gonna come down to, well, is it the intent that Paul's talking about, or is it the action that Paul's talking about? The answer is we don't really know. Could it be both? Oh my goodness, that would be problematic. Um, you know, and that's why good Christians are going to different directions. All right, so I'm going to go, if you guys are cool, I'm going to give you my thought on it, unless you guys have other comments. Now, you're going to, you're going to look at this and be like, this is the most mad answer I've ever run into, and you're going to be super not impressed after all this amazing theology, uh, because I just basically have a decision chart, okay? Mainly because I'm really sort of skeptical of scholastic theology as a concept, but you guys have known me long enough to know that I am. So, all right, here we go. Two possibilities when communion is done online for a temporary emergency, okay? So there's my qualifications. Temporary emergency done online. You're either getting communion or you're not, right? 
It either is or is not valid. There's no in-between scenarios, right? Okay. Therefore, you have four possible outcomes logically. Do y'all hear me? I'm getting an alert that my internet is unstable. All right. Scenario one, I provide you online communion, which is valid, a which equals you got communion. So yay, right? Scenario two, I provide you online communion, which is not valid. You had a snack. Scenario three, I do not provide you communion, which is in fact valid. I have withheld communion and possibly violated your dignity. Scenario four, I do not provide you communion, which is in fact invalid. In other words, communion wouldn't have happened. Therefore, you have missed a snack. So in a very Occam's razor sort of approach that I have to things, my argument would be, I think we should provide online communion because worst case scenario, you ate a snack. Now, go back to my caveat at the beginning. I said under temporary emergency basis. Why? Because in the long term, I think there is a possible danger, which is pointed out by many good faithful Christians, which is, in the long term, if I'm offering you something that isn't real, then yeah, you might be opting for it when you could get the real thing. And yeah, that would be harmful. But in an emergency, isn't it better to try to give you something? And if it turns out not to be real, well, I never gave you any, you know, you weren't going to get it the other way. Either. You know what I mean? It's better to throw the noodle on the wall than never throw the noodle at, at all. Because maybe it sticks. And I'd much rather mistakenly mislead you for a short period of time and feed you extra snacks than go ahead and withhold communion when I could have been helping. All right, that is the end of my presentation. I would love y'all's thoughts. Let me stop sharing. I know, right? It's like such an uneloquent answer to all this eloquent theology we've been debating for. It, it's been a theology I didn't worry about for un, until five, six years ago, six years ago, because there was always an ordained person in the house. <laughs> you know, so so it's, it's a it's a new problem for me. Um, it's a frustrating problem. <laughs> Uh, wait, Gil, who who was, was ordained? David was built. Yeah, my dad it's was an ordained. He was ordained bef back in the '60s when ordained deacons were legal to give communion. So he was always authorized to give communion in the church. Your your grandpa, the philosophy professor, was also an ordained minister. Uh -huh. He was an ordained deacon. Yes, he was. And he's giving, he gave, he was asked to deliver communion the Sunday he had, he had his stroke on Tuesday. He did the service and delivered communion on Sunday before he went in the hospital. I see. I, I don't know how I missed that. Because <laughs> he never had a call, right? Yeah. Right. Because as a deacon, you don't have a call. <laughs> Okay. You serve in the church that you belong to. Okay, so he, he falls into my rubric of deacon. Yes. Okay. Yes. But he would be called the word in sacrament and therefore able to bless elements himself, is my understanding of his. Or he ability. was, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And not just redistribute stuff that's, yeah. Yeah. So and I don't know your background, David, so it wouldn't have been like an Episcopal deacon. It's more Presbyterian understanding. Yeah. Yeah, in today's world. In today's you know, world. In the LCA, it was whatever it was. Yeah, in the LCA, it was a whole different football game. His robe is still upstairs. Heck yeah. Yeah, no, no, I didn't mean that in any demeaning way. I was just trying to translate for folks who had different backgrounds. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it's because they have UCC ministers every place else. So. Absolutely. <laughs> you turn around, there's a minister. <laughs> um, 
But the only place I've ever been denied communion is in a Missouri, a, the Missouri Senate of, yeah, I'd love to have you come, but by the way, just make sure you don't go up. Or when the plate comes, just pass it by. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because I'm used to churches where you used to pass it and then you'd, you'd actually say the words to the next person. Mm -hmm. So even if it was set up front, as, yeah. as the plate was passed through the pews, you actually communed the person next to you. All right, just for the sake I of our later online group, I'm going to stop the recording if that's okay with you all. We can keep chatting for however long you want. Okay? <laughs>